So our next speaker is a bit of a long shot, uh, and, I, and I want to tell you how um, I got to that place. Uh, Shmuley, for me, represented a dynamic rendition of an old-time religion, and, and that got me thinking about what about new religions, and yesterday we touched on what I thought was possibly a new religion, that is the religion of environmentalism, and just now we heard from Ray about what I think of as the church of science fiction. Um, and, and so um, it was in pursuing those thoughts that um, I, I came across this image. I don't know if you can all see it from here. Maybe a camera can pick it up. I'm sure our next speaker will probably bring out images of his own. And well, that got me wondering are these an unknown species? Uh, is it perhaps a hoax? Are these alien beings? Might God have been an astronaut? So I invited Brian Forster to come out here and tell us about his finds all the way from Peru. Coffee? Thank you. <laughs> and ahead. And ahead, that's right. <laughs> This is real. This is actually an exact copy of uh, a 20-month-old child that was found in Paracas, Peru. We know it was 20 months old based on a, uh, a dentist, forensic dentist. From carbon-14 testing, we know that uh, she died 1,950 years ago. And the color of the hair which is strawberry blonde, is the color that we found when we unwrapped it. Initial testing indicates that this is not the result of dye or oxidation or age, but this person could have been genetically strawberry blonde 1,400 years before Columbus arrived in the New World. So I became fascinated with, uh, a number of years ago, with what's called cranial deformation because it's a practice that was done on every inhabited continent, um, most commonly 2,000 years ago, but in some cases much farther back. And what we found is that, in general, this was only done amongst the royalty of a civilization. Now, when I first saw this skull in person, uh, it's at the Ica Museum in Peru, and again, it's, it's real. I was very intrigued because, of course, if there was only one of them on the planet, you could say, well, that's you know, a freak of nature or something. But in fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them, in institutions and museums around the world. And what's most intriguing is that the largest ones come from one graveyard in Peru. The one which is in the top left, top right, center left, bottom left, and bottom right are all from one graveyard called Chongos on the coast of Peru, which I found intriguing, and no archaeologist had been studying these since the 1920s. Some people um, theorized that perhaps, perhaps the ancient Egyptians looked like this, that is uh, Metatatan on the left, who was the daughter of Nefertiti. But unfortunately, um, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and the entire, um, what's called the Amarna family, were all uh, wiped out by the priesthood, and so their bodies have never been found. This uh, mummy is thought possibly to have been Nefertiti, but Nefertiti um, has never been DNA, or this has never been DNA tested in order to try to compare with who Nefertiti may have been. So what it is, is amongst the Egyptians, it was most likely an artistic thing, because you see the size of the skull is quite different from the artistic representation. But this one we do know, this is Tutankhamun. And Tutankhamun does look a little bit different. You can see his cerebellum is slightly larger, and he has a dent in the top of his head, but you wouldn't call this that different from what a normal human being looks like. That actually, the bottom right, that is his uh, CAT scan of, of his head. 
but why the depiction in Egyptian art of Akhenaten and Nefertiti with babies or children having elongated skulls is the question. The people who were called the Mangbetu of Congo, they performed cranial deformation, as you can see with this royal baby, and they originally came from Sudan, and in their oral tradition, they state that they come from Egypt. And this was a royal um, person of that culture. The, the practice was stopped in the 1950s. And here in Melanesia, the same practice amongst the royal people was carried out. As I said, it was a global phenomenon. And most archaeologists and anthropologists believe that these people who lived near Vanuatu in Melanesia um, came via the sea from some part of Asia, but if you find their oral tradition, they state that they originally came from Egypt. This is another example of a, a child from one of those islands. And also on the island of Malta, there's a place called the Hypogeum, which is megalithic. No one knows how old it is. But 200 skulls, long skulls like this, were found and they were taken off display about 20 years ago, and no one's allowed to have access with them, or of them. This, uh, many were found in Siberia. Even the Han performed this cranial deformation. And this woman lived about the third century AD in Austria. She was of, of royalty. And even up to the Middle Ages, and even more recent, royal people of Europe performed this because globally, if you ask three, uh, you're given three answers as to why this was done. Number one, it was thought to be aesthetically pleasing. Number two, they thought it increased the intelligence of the children. And number three, this is what their ancestors looked like. It's also been found in Central America. This is an uh, Actually, this is Maya, this is Olmec, this is a site called Tiwanaku in Bolivia, which is megalithic. No one actually knows when uh, Tiwanaku and its adjoining site, Pumapunku, were built. And these two were taken off display. I've been to the uh, museum here at Tiwanaku many times asking where the skulls are, and all I've been told is they're out being cleaned and they will never be put on display again. This uh, child uh, is ancient from Bolivia, and as, uh, as you can see, the head is the size of the torso. This is not the result of any known disease. It's not hydrocephaly, it's not water on the brain. And this is a child that was found in the Sacred Valley of Peru, near Cusco. The important thing is that none of these that you've seen has ever been DNA tested or carbon-14 tested. These were found at what's called the Cori Cancha in Cusco. That was the center of the Inca world. And if I can't actually read the actual date on it, but they, they have titled it at, at these being, uh, that these people died 1400 and something AD, however, They've never been DNA tested. They've never been carbon-14 tested. So they're making assumptions that these are Inca, but no one knows how old they are. The practice was done in North America. These are lit uh, literally what are called the Flathead Indians. And these are other approaches that were done in order to change the shape of a baby's skull to uh, acquire a certain shape. This is the more common practice in Peru and Bolivia. And even today, people of the Amazon still perform this. This is uh, quite intriguing because this was supposedly an eight-month-old fetus. Uh, the actual, it's, of course, it's a drawing done in the 19th century, but the original is in the collection uh, in the National Museum of Peru. And as you can see, the head is the size, at least of the torso, and it has developed teeth. Uh, this is a 2,000-year-old artifact that was found in, in Bolivia. The central figure is what's called Viracocha, who is the creator god. And on either side, 
he's flanked by females who are larger in many ways than he is. And these are other artifacts which are 2,000 plus years old. My focus has been on a, this little place called Paracas in Peru, south of Lima. And the royal people of this area, according to conventional archaeology, suddenly appeared about 3,500 years ago and disappeared 2,000 years ago. The only aspect of this culture which is studied by conventional archaeology are their textiles. But they had incredible um, funerary practices. Um, no one literally knows where they came from. This is a, one of the finest examples of a Paracas ancient skull. And again, as you can see with the hair, the hair is not only reddish, it's also wavy, and it's finer than Native American hair. Native Americans have black hair, not this color. Initial testing indicates this is genetic. And a German study that was done about five years ago comparing the genetics of people of the highlands of Peru, like where the famous Inca lived, and on the coast of Peru, found out that there's a significant difference between them. That the coastal population is quite different from the highland population. And so that begs the question, is it possible that part of the genetic makeup of the Paracas people is not from the Bering Land Bridge, that they came by some other way? The obvious answer would be by the ocean. If you've ever been to or have read anything about the Nazca lines and figures, archaeologists believe that this, which is called the astronaut, was made by the Paracas people who inhabited the area prior to the Nazca people who made the spider and other figures. And this is what's called the candelabro. It's 450 feet tall. It can only be seen from the ocean. It's located at Paracas, Peru. And the more work we do on this, the more it seems that this is a navigational instrument. It's like a homing beacon for seafarers. So where's the next point of land if you go west? That's Easter Island. Most archaeologists believe that the red thing on top of the Moai figures is a hat or some kind of adornment. But if you ask the, the people themselves, and that's what I do everywhere, is I always ask what is the oral tradition and compare that to what archaeologists think. The native people say that is red hair. Those are the people who lived here before we did, we the Polynesians. There are all sorts of different shapes and sizes of, of these skulls that you can find in Peru. Some have large, about 30% larger volume than a normal human being. And they, the Paracas people 2,000 plus years ago were masters at brain surgery. They were able to um, cut into the skull and there are, again, hundreds if not thousands of examples of this and a very high percentage of the patients survived, as in this example, where you see that the bone has grown right back over top of where the uh, surgery was done. This would have taken years, not weeks. So this person survived. And this is what your skull looks like. This is what a normal human being looks like. There is a occipital plate, a frontal plate, and two parietal plates. But in a certain percentage of the Paracas skulls, this is what your skull would look like. The Paracas, there is only one suture. And even if we zoom in closer, you can see that what was called the parietal suture, which should be going vertical, doesn't exist whatsoever. I've shown these skulls to doctors who have come to visit me in Peru, and none of them have an answer as to why this exists. This is what the back of your skull looks like. This is what the back of an elongated skull looks like. It has these two little holes, which are in every single one, which is curious. Is it part of the binding process? Or if you look here, that's called the foramen, and you have that. It's a little hole on either side of your jaw. That's where nerve and blood flow comes out of. So it's possible that the holes in the back of the head 
are an evolutionary thing, that because of the size of the skull, for proper blood flow, evolution uh, created that. So that means there could be a genetic component to a small percentage of these skulls. And this is one of the most classic ones that exists um, in the Paracas History Museum. It is possible that this is the result of cranial deformation, but it is such a complex design that that's why we're presently conducting DNA testing on a number of these individuals. Um, we have a genetics lab in the United States working with us, and we're getting support from the Peruvian government. I also wonder, even if uh, it's a case of cranial deformation, how would the brain function if the shape is completely different like that? If the contact between the hemispheres is different, would these people have had thought processes different from ours? And this is probably the most interesting example. It's in a tiny museum an hour south of Cusco, Peru has been examined by a number of physicians, nurses, dentists, etc., and recently went through a battery of um, scientific tests. You can see that the eye sockets are much bigger than they should be, that the bridge of the nose is higher than uh, normal Homo sapiens, and the teeth, dentists who look at the teeth say it has the, the dentition of a 10-year-old. And when they did x-rays, they could find no um, examples of where the second row or where the adult row of teeth should come in. Also, they have done DNA testing, and so far they found the mother's DNA, which they have uh, mitochondrial, which they have not been able to fully analyze, but there's a complete absence of the father, which is odd. And this is the size of, of what this looks like. The head is the size of the torso, if not bigger. Other examples of strained skulls have been found, and this man who went through ridicule, called Lloyd Pye, found something he called the star child skull that has 25 different features, uh, 25 features which make it unlikely to be homo sapiens, including the fact that the bone material is not bone like we have, but it's more like um, uh, enamel, tooth enamel. But it was through him that I was able to uh, uh, have samples through the proper channels sent to a geneticist in the United States. Again, I've had a number of different doctors come and look physically at these skulls, and I can see the way their brain process works, because through their training, they know what a human being looks like. And when they look at this, they're fascinated, they spend hours looking at them, and then I never hear from them again. <laughs> and an artist um, called Bar Marcia Moore has done 3D modeling of what she thinks these people look like. And again, I'm stressing people. Oop. And this, honestly, is what the mainstream archaeologists in Peru thinks that these people looked like. Um, I'm only, honestly, after years at the beginning of this, but I'm so fascinated, I will spend the rest of my life figuring out this aspect of what is called forbidden archaeology. Forbidden because it doesn't fit the typical Darwinian paradigm. But there are many examples of many things around the world that don't fit that paradigm. And I think we owe it to ourselves to understand the truth about who we are, how old we are, and what we have accomplished in the past. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot. Bria, haven't you buried the lead? The, well, the thing that stimulated me and got me motivated to get in touch with you was the reference that I came across, which says 
that some genetic tests that have been done have found that the DNA in the skulls that were, quote, unknown in any human primate or animal known so far. That's true. That slide, unfortunately, was <laughs> missing. But initial DNA testing uh, has shown that there are segments of DNA from at least one Paraka skull that doesn't fit Homo sapiens um, or Denisovan or any known humanoid. And so that became something which was blasted around the planet. And of course, I was attacked heavily for it. But that is why now we're working with the Peruvian government and having multiple samples sent to a genetics laboratory. Or in fact, uh, the University of California uh, contacted me two days ago and said that they would do free genetic testing um, for us, because this is an incredibly expensive procedure. Uh, if you have your blood sample taken, of course, you can find out wherever it is that your ancestors came from, etc. But these people mysteriously died out 2,000 years ago, and DNA breaks down just like any organic material would. So something which is DNA, which is 2,000 years ago, requires the most advanced uh, uh, computer programming to try to reassemble these tiny pieces of DNA. And that's basically where, I'm, where we are at right now. And how far away are we from some results out of this process? Um, we are within months of getting in more initial results. He actually did the test once and couldn't believe what he found. I was staring at my computer screen for half an hour. And then he did two further tests. But as soon as he said that, then I was attacked, of course, by conventional archaeologists. And so that's why we have to keep it kind of hush-hush until we get a broad spectrum of results in order to uh, be able to actually publish anything properly. But, but your own belief still is that these are humans? Uh, I, I can't say. What I will say is I doubt that, that uh, the ancestors of these people are what we call homo sapiens. And again, stuff like this is just like from the movie Indiana, from the Indi Indiana Jones film where they found the Ark of the Covenant, they put it in a box and they hid it away. There are thousands, if not millions of artifacts which conventional science refuses to even look at because they don't fit the conventional story. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, hold up to my head. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Oh, that's great.